Hey, welcome to Barley and Hops. I'm George. Uh, you caught me again. The, today's another one of those great days for our brewing community. Hey, I've got several fast ferments available. Uh, I'm, no, I'm not talking about for sale. I'm talk, I mean, as in they're empty, so they're available. It, it's time to get back to brewing. So I thought I'd share it with you while I do that. I've got three actually empty. So what I'm going to try to do today, I know definitely what I'm going to knock out is the last concentrate uh, wine recipe that we're going to do uh, in a video. Uh, from now on, we're going to start doing fresh fruits uh, so we can start using our fresh fruit press. Um, and there's a little bit of a difference in technique when you start using fresh fruits to make wines as opposed to, as opposed to the, uh, the kits or concentrates. Uh, but it's really, really easy to transition from one to the next, and, and you, you'll be extremely happy no matter what you do. Okay, but I've got three of them, so I'm going to do that. I also want to do, um, I'm thinking this afternoon I might shoot a video on rum. I want to do a, an exquisite rum. Um, and then I've got one more left, and I'm, and I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do in that. We might just do a beer. Uh, just uh, just to round out the day, and that way we can have three different ones in the store all at the same time. Okay. Um, hey, listen, here's what I got going on. Um, the good news is, is I got all my equipment right here and readily available. And as promised from the last time, we're going to take this in such a manner that this should avoid or eliminate all of your questions because we're even going to, we're going to test pH. Uh, we're going to talk about pH and adjustment of pH if that's necessary. Uh, we're also going to talk about the acidity of wine. We're going to talk about the importance of the acidity of wine, and then we're going to talk about how to test it, and then how to adjust it. And then what is the correlation between acidity and pH? Because, you know, pH is a measurement of alkalinity and acidity on a sliding scale. Oh, we'll get to that. That's All right, here's what I got. Um, my fast ferment, and I've had this one here for almost, this is probably one of the originals. I got this one almost two years ago, uh, so I've been using the heck out of this thing. So, I mean, that's just a demonstration of its durability. Uh, I'm going to remove this off of here and show you what I've got going on, though. Let me set this. Our, um, we're going to use the bag, the thermal blanket. Uh, and we did a video on that about a week or two ago, and we showed you all the accessories to the thermal blanket. But this time, we're going to actually use it. And what I've done is I've taken the, you see, they've got these... Uh, let me grab a hold of them. I've got them laying here somewhere because I know I wanted to show them to you. Oh, here they are. And these are the pads that cover the slits on the back. And you'll see, you see, yeah, there's one right there. And then there's the other one. And you'll see that slit. And what that slit is for is to go over top. You put these on when you're not when you don't use the bag against the wall. But when you use the bag against the wall, these come off, and these slits go over top of the rails that you've got mounted to the wall. But the great thing is, is they they give you an extra two of these in your packet that comes with the jacket. So uh, once you mount these to the wall, you don't want to have to take them off the wall every time. So they give you two extras. So whenever you take the bag off the wall, if you want to, you can just put these back on there. You can use the bag away from the wall. So what I did was I took these, pulled the screws out, and of course laid these against the wall with the Velcro. Take a Velcro edge facing out, because that's what we're going to hook to. And then I just screwed them back in. So I've got one of these patches looking like this, and one patch over here looking like that, just ready to receive the bag. So what we'll do is make sure that those patches are off those. And then I'm going to line that up on each one of those rails. There we go. And then I'm going to push the bag up against the wall. And it will marry up with that Velcro. And it seals the back. Now, the Velcro is not holding the bag up. What the Velcro is doing is the Velcro is sealing the back of that bag so no temperature escapes. No, there's no thermal transfer going on. And it makes it look really neat, too. Uh, what's holding it up is those reinforced slits that they've got already cut into the bag, into the thermal bag, so your fast ferment will sit inside here and you can maintain the temperature. So guess what? We're going to do that too. We're going to try to maintain that temperature. Uh, they claim, and uh, they've, they've got the data to prove it, that they've got a 16 degree temperature drop between ambient temperature, that being out here, and inside by using a 2 liter bottle of ice. They switch out every 24 or 36 hours. 
Okay. <clears throat> I wonder how many of you uh, have had the same or similar challenges that we've had here is cleaning these things. They're really easy to get to. You know that. I mean, you can get into them and clean them. But um, I think, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but I have, is that uh, they, uh, if, if you don't get them good and clean, you'll, you'll look back into them and after they dry out, you'll, you'll stick your nose down because, you know, your nose is your best detector. You'll, you'll go, oh, that smelled like, uh, there's no real good word for it. That smelled like ass. Um, or maybe it smelled like two asses, but that'll happen. They'll, you know, stuff will start to grow inside there that you can't see, so... Uh, my recommendation is just make sure you're using a really good cleanser. Um, yeah, you know, your star sand is really great for a sanitizer, but not as much a cleanser. So there's several different. There's a cut like a three-step cleanser. There's an alkaline-based cleanser. Uh, but the best cleaning cloth is this. Take advantage of what you've got. Okay, your nose is great for sensing whether there's something absolute, actually wrong or not. And you can usually do that by smelling. Uh, and if yours doesn't work, find someone who's got one that does because it's really easy. Uh, that, they'll smell it and they'll let you know if there's something off there or not. But that's the best indicator um, aside from using some kind of chemicals to, to check it. Uh, that, the hands, uh, the dexterity of your fingers and your fingertips, are, you're so sensitive. You're a whole lot more sensitive than you think you are. So, and, and also you're a lot softer. You won't scratch the inside of this. So if you use your hand, to, uh, to rub the inside of this when you've got warm water in there with your soap or with your cleanser solution. That really, really works well. But you get that thing all nice and cleaned out and it should smell. It shouldn't have a smell. Uh, so w when you smell it if, it, if it doesn't trip your nose, then you know, you're know you probably good and clean. And then of course I spray it with star sand and then just dump it out and let it air dry. All right, let's put this in here. set this on its merry way oh there's one there you go all right so that sets there now at the very end we'll put the uh we'll put the lid on and of course we're going to put our airlock and our airlock is going to go through the lid through the top here where this flap is so we'll be able to seal this up completely all right some of the other equipment that i've got out here to show you and that we're going to use we're going to use our refractometer and we're going to use a refractometer because I'm getting used to using it. And it's real simple. It's auto temperature correcting. So I don't have to really concern myself with bringing my leads down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which the hydrometer has been calibrated for. Whoops. Or if I don't do that, you know, using a conversion factor, this will just give me a reading right away. But I'm going to use both today. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll get a reading from both and we'll be able to share that and explain that. Um, I also got another, a different type of uh, hydrometer, and um, this is one where some of you may be familiar with. Uh, but, but remember, all hydrometers are the same. Uh, there are two different types of measuring tools. There's a hydrometer, and then there's a proof and trail hydrometer. The proof and trail hydrometer is for spirits and whiskey, uh, and you can't mix the two up. Uh, of course, that scale starts here and goes that way. Uh, but you'll, you've got a lot of you have this one. It's color coded. Oh, it's really nice, really neat. You know, it, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's exactly the same thing um, as this one, which is not color coded. So you know, we call that exactly the same, only different. Um, and, and really, the difference is 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 like a, a a 2012 Prius, a green one, or a 2012 Prius, a blue one. Uh, they're both exactly the same. They just happen to be different colors. And that's what this is. They're just, one's color-coded, one's not. But they read exactly the same thing. So we're going to go through that again. And uh, we're also going to use our pH meter. And our pH meter is going to tell us what the pH is of our must. Or, yeah, must, because the leaves is what's in the bottom. So it's going to tell us what the uh, pH is of our of must. And uh, we'll show you how to read that again. And uh, we'll calibrate it and get things going. So this shouldn't take long at all once we get headed in that direction. Wine thief to get myself some of that wine out of there. Now, as far as ingredients are concerned, this is the last one. So this time we picked the Welch's 100% grape juice. A little bit more expensive on the shelf. About $1.89 a can. And I got 10 of these. So what my intent is is to make... 
about five gallons. I'm not going to go to the full six this time. We're just going to stop at like five gallons. So I'm going to use 10 cans and then I'm going to fill the rest up with water. Uh, we're going to test the acidity, the pH. We're going to see what we need to do, if at all, if any, adjustment before we add our yeast. So we're going to get right into that here shortly. One last thing I wanted to show you, and that is uh, several weeks ago when we did a video, we, we did a lot of different ones, but we did one in specific on mash turning to vinegar. It, just as an, a demonstration or as an example to you, this is one that I did. This is one of the mashes that I did. It's been sitting here. It's been sitting in the back room for about ooh, almost a month. Um, and lo and behold, it's not vinegar. Uh, as we told you, it, it can't turn to vinegar. So if you don't get to your mash right away when you're distilling, what you may or may not be distilling, if that happens, uh, it won't turn to vinegar on you. It'll just sit there. So um, don't worry about it. Don't, uh, I, get, I get calls all the time, you know, I'm in a hurry. I got to get it done because it'll turn to vinegar. Uh, that won't happen. Now, some of your wines now, you let a wine sit a long, long time, it, it, it could potentially turn to vinegar. You know, it's, uh, you get that bacteria in there, it'll, it'll convert that alcohol and everything else, it'll start to turn to a vinegar. Another way to do that is to actually introduce the mother, which is really another form of a bacteria. But it's called the mother uh, from an apple cider. Uh, if you introduce that mother in there, uh, it will also start to sprout and grow, and it will make vinegar. So you see, you have to actually work at it. You have to try to turn that to vinegar. Uh, it just doesn't happen all by itself. Um, and if it smells um, a little bit funky, uh, smells a little bit like ass, uh, it's probably supposed to. Uh, it, it'll be sour. If you taste it, it'll be sour. It should be sour, and it should have a sour, pungent odor to it. Um, oh, one last thing is that uh, that odor, and I get this call a lot. I wanted to share this so that everybody could understand. Um, yeast are very, very viable, uh, and they, they will work extremely hard for you. Uh, if you get them into an environment that's extremely warm, let's say 90 degrees or so, they're going to work, um, especially a distiller's yeast. A distiller's yeast will, will ferment rapidly at about 90 degrees, sometimes even higher than that. But just remember that it's going to produce like a sulfur odor. Uh, it, there, there'll be this off odor to it that's going to be pretty rank in the room. It'll make the house smell. Your wife will be very, very upset with you. Uh, matter of fact, you'll be unhappy. It happens up here every once in a while. I forget to leave the air conditioner on and I'll come in in the morning. I've got to open the windows and the doors and I got to let it air out because it got too warm overnight and yeast started going crazy. and. We started to get this odor. Um, if you ferment at a lower temperature, uh, that odor is not present any longer. So, you know, your yeast kind of take it easy. But when they start to stress, and, um, and there's a lot of other things that can happen. But trust me, your, your mash, your wine, all of that is still fine. Uh, it's just that your yeast are really creating an odor and it really smells awful. Uh, if you intend to do that, one thing you can do is you can get an airlock and you can put a tube on the top of the airlock and especially those three-piece airlocks that's got the small dome inside remove that take a half inch hose put it on top of that and run it out the window uh, and leave it sit there and then all that gas will escape out the window uh, or you can put it in a small bucket outside the window so no air gets back in but that way at least that you know all that gas and odor uh, it's like flatulence in a way like somebody you know you got a bunch of people come to your house and you know one of the 12 people in that room did something. No one wants to admit it, but everybody knows it's there. Uh, that's kind of what it's going to smell like. Uh, it'll be there for quite a while. Okay, let's get back to uh, exactly what we're doing here today, and we're going to start making our, uh, our Welch's grape juice wine. This is going to be a low uh, concentrate, alcohol concentrate wine, because we want this to be a sipping a uh, table wine that's something you can enjoy with just about any meal so we'll get to it uh, and the easiest way to do this is just to shoot right at it I've already sprayed everything with um, my star sand I've got my trash can sitting there waiting on me and we are going at it Ooh, I just looked down to make sure I had that ball cut off shut off because uh, that would have been an awful mess had I not. I haven't put the ball on yet, 
I've got the ball sitting over here. Um, it's not critical to have that ball on there right away. Now I'm leaving these cans out because what I want to do is I want to rinse out. Uh, the, I'll, well, I'll do that in the very end. Uh, and I won't bore you with it, but what I'll do is I'll rinse out these cans with a little bit of water on each one just to make sure they get it all filled up. So we'll be back with you shortly as soon as we get this all filled up. And then uh, we're going to go on to the next step and start to do our testing and our evaluating. And then we'll, we'll do some great predicting and then we'll be able to come back and find out if our findings match our predictions. Happy brewing.